Matthew 23, let's get into it. Chapter 23, verse 1, Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Now remember, if you've been with us, we've been going through the New Testament here, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We find ourselves, Matthew 23, Jesus is at this place where he has come to Jerusalem. He's in the final days of his life. He's going to the cross faithfully, obediently, purposefully, intentionally. And at this time, he's in the temple area, and he's been interacting with the Jewish leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. He's been going back and forth, as we've, if you've been with us the last few weeks. And at this point, he turns to his disciples and the crowds that have gathered, and it's interesting here, he talks to them, but he's openly rebuking these religious leaders. And, I mean, to sum it up, while you're still in tune here, before you tune out, to sum it up, the religious leaders of the time were, were creating stumbling blocks for people to have an intimate, right relationship with God. They'd use legalistic systems, uh, religion, basically, the practice of religion had trumped a relationship with God. There's the summary of the chapter. But stay tuned here. <laughs> um, so as we get into this, I think there's a couple things that I like to look at this. Personally, what is Jesus saying? I mean, if we're just observing the text, who's he talking to? What is he saying? And then as we interpret the text, we find that he's going to be addressing these religious leaders, but there's also application for our own lives as he calls out these ones who had claimed faith, but we'll see over and over and over and over again, he calls them hypocrites, the way they practice faith. So we're going to take a look at that. First of all, he says that they have seated themselves, these scribes and the Pharisees, at the seat of Moses. Number one, scribes, these were in ancient Israel, they were learned men whose business was to study the law. Not only did they study the law, but they would reproduce. Their job was to preserve the scriptures, and they took their job very seriously. They would copy and recopy what we would call the Bible, and meticulously counting dots and lines and spaces. And so they would have known the word very well. The Pharisees, uh, these were the leaders of the time, leaders of the synagogues of the time. They had a legalistic approach to their relationship with God. They taught that the law was the highest and the best and that all uh, Jews should obey the 600 plus commandments in the Torah. And that's why when we read that a few times, we've seen where Jesus calls them out when they're having this back and forth and Jesus says, have you not read the scriptures? Thinking about the scribes and Pharisees, these would have been the ones who had known the scriptures. I mean, they wrote the scriptures. They knew, they wrote commentaries on the scriptures. They rewrote the scriptures. They studied the scriptures. They memorized the scriptures. And so when Jesus has that statement, have you not read? It was a slap in the face. Because the truth is, we saw last week, chapter 22, verse 29, he said, you're mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. And so they knew about the scriptures but we could say they didn't know the scriptures, meaning they didn't actually take them to heart. Interesting, too, here that says they had seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Now, this was a place of authority. In the synagogues, they would have this seat. Nick, you have that first picture? If you go to Israel, hey, this is a uh, little concrete seat here. And one of the ancient, uh, this is actually a replica of the real thing. The real thing's in a museum in Jerusalem, but this is actually on site uh, in the northern region of Galilee there, in northern region of Israel, in one of the ancient ruins. And there's Mo Moses. <laughs> Brandon had seated himself at the seat of Moses. <laughs> um, I want to give you a little visual so you can have a, a picture of what this looked like. But this was a place of authority. So they had put themselves in this place of authority meaning that they were called, the people were called to listen and to obey what they had said here. And what's interesting here is, you think about this idea of leadership and, and strong versus weak. Weak leadership needs titles and demands respect and demands obedience. 
and weak leadership asserts themselves into positions of authority, where true leadership, as Jesus models, I'm sure you've experienced, doesn't need titles, doesn't need to assert their own authority. True leadership is just easy to follow that way. But these guys, the problem was is hypocrisy. We'll see it over and over again. If you look down at verse 13 all the way to the end, you'll, you'll see hypocrisy, hypocrites, 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 over and over and over again. And it was this thing of hypocrisy that had weakened their authority. What's interesting to me, though, look at verse 3. Jesus says, therefore, they had this particular position. He says, therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. It's interesting here, Jesus actually says, listen to what they say, but don't do it. And, or don't do what they do, sorry. Listen to them say, do what they, what they say, but don't do as they do. And I think that an important thing, a takeaway for us, is that sometimes we're called to obey authority. And people that have been put into positions of authority, and we're called to obey no matter what they say or do in their personal life in a way, we're called to obey these things. And Jesus says here to do, he says, do and observe, but don't do according to their deeds. And so I think we can learn from those, and it certainly is difficult. I mean, you understand that it is difficult to follow someone who says one thing and does something else. It's really difficult. And causes all kinds of issues, especially you know, hypocritical leadership just undermines uh, anything that's being tried to, trying to be communicated. Here they abuse their position. Verse 4, he says, they tie up heavy burdens and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. And so Jesus is going to point something out here. Speaking of what the religious leaders are promoting here is legalistic religion. And legalism is performance-based religion. Basically, you know, if, if you do this, then this will happen. It's, it's based on your performance. And legalistic legalism, performance-based religion, always lays heavy burdens on people, and it goes beyond what the Scripture teaches. The Scripture is very clear in teaching. It's, it's, it points to Jesus and Jesus only. It's not Jesus plus whatever you can do in your own strength or your performance. It's Jesus only. And so legalism and what these guys were doing, they were laying heavy burdens. Now, what does Jesus talk about burdens? Look back at Matthew 11, if you would. Jesus mentions burdens, and I want you to just compare for a moment what Jesus offers and what legalistic religion offers. So Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. So I will give you rest. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find a rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So compare the difference there. One, we have this legalistic, performance-based religion, which Jesus says are laying heavy burdens on God's people. And we have what Jesus says. He says, I offer rest. He says, learn from me. My yoke is easy. He says, my burden, verse 30, is light. Corrupt leadership and legalistic religion always lays heavy burdens on people. That's how they try to keep control. And it goes beyond what the scriptures teach. Legalism puts unnecessary burden on God's people. It creates hindrances between God and you. Here's the thing. I mentioned this several times. I will continue to say this as long as I have opportunity. God does not want things between you and him. He wants to remove obstacles between you and him. 
And the religious leaders of the time, Jesus' time, had become obstacles. And their legalistic approach stunted people's relationship with God. And it always will in churches today, if we take a legalistic approach, it will stunt our relationship with God. It'll hamstring the church. It needs to be Jesus only. And note too, when we look at these verses in Matthew 11, we would call this a gospel-centered faith. The idea is that we put our lives and we put our faith into Jesus Christ. And, and we trust him. We learn from him, the scripture says, and we come to him to find rest. We would put this under a gospel-centered life. And we look at this idea of gospel-centered. It, it means that our identity, our worth, our rest, all we are is gospel-centered, meaning it's centered around the good news that it's based on the performance of Jesus Christ, what he did, not your performance of what you can do. It says when we come to him, it says we find rest. Another problem with a legalistic approach or a performance-based faith approach would be it causes self-glorification. What do I mean by that? Meaning, if we set up a system where your relationship with God is dependent upon your performance, well, then you begin to trust in you. You begin to glorify self. You think, well, I can rise. I can, I can do enough good works. I can perform really well in this area. And, and you begin to elevate yourself, to glorify yourself, to mean your relationship with God is dependent upon you. Your right standing with God is dependent upon you and your performance. That's self-glorification. And that's exactly what these guys have done. Check, take a look at it. Back to uh, chapter 23. Ver look at verse 5. Remember, he's talking about them openly. He's, he's instructing the crowds and his disciples. Verse 5, he says, They do all their deeds to be noticed by men. You notice this was man-pleasers. What did Jesus say on the Sermon on the Mount? He said, let your light shine in such a way that they may glorify your self? No, what did he say? Glorify your Father who's in heaven, Matthew chapter 5. You are to do good works. You are to let your light shine. We live for Christ, and we do these good works for him, but for his glory, not our glory. Let our light shine so much... He gets the glory. These guys had come to a practice where they wanted to be noticed by men. It says, For they broaden their, verse 5, phylacteries, and they lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces, being called rabbi by men. Jesus says here, though, verse 8, says, do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. He says, do not be, call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. He says, do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. He says, but the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. They broaden their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. It's interesting, these little phylacteries and the, the tassels, these are Old Testament references. We get these concepts from Exodus 13 and Deuteronomy chapter 6. And where God had directed the Israelites to, in a way, bind God's word on their hand and on their head. And there's this concept there that everything that we would do, we would remember God's word. And in our head, we would put ourselves under his authority. We would keep God sovereign in our lives. We would remember his word. It was a thing of remembrance. And and the phylacteries themselves are these little leather boxes, and they have these long strap, leather straps. If you've ever been to Israel, you may have seen an Orthodox Jew 
uh, have them, but they, they'll wrap them around their arms, and, and then there's one that goes on their head. And right now, in fact, if you go to uh, Jerusalem, when we go to the Western Wall, if we get there for a morning prayer, we'll actually see the conservative Orthodox Jews will do these things to this day. And in the boxes contain four Old Testament scriptures from Exodus and Deuteronomy. And again, the concept was to be remembering God's word, but they had taken what God had meant for the heart, meaning the things that we do and the things that we think, to remember God and his word and sovereignty in our lives, and they had made this, this physical manifestation of it where they become to trust in the, the strapping on of these phylacteries. And then the tassels, too, come from Numbers 15, 38 to 39. Verse 39 says, It shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord, so as to do them and to not follow after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you played the harlot. So both of these things were to be remembrance of God's sovereign work deliverance and a sovereignty in their lives. But they had turned it into this religious practice and a way to sort of uh, demonstrate their spirituality. So they would enlarge in their phylacteries, they have these bigger boxes, you know, and it would sort of demonstrate, uh, you know, they were more spiritual. You know, one of the things that we do as a, a religious practice, we say we've talked about this, is we take communion. And we do this twice a month, the mid-Wednesday of the month, the last Sunday of the month. And we got these little crackers and a little juice, and we do these in, in remembrance of God. Now, now, what if, you know, it's time to take communion, and I'm spiritual, you know. So I've got my cracker, and I've got my juice. Does this make me more spiritual? My cracker's bigger than your cracker. She, it's sort of ridiculous, right? You, you get the concept. You get the idea. They had tried to make themselves look more spiritual. And I think, you know, this speaks to all cultures of all time, but, you know, I tell you, American Christianity is a funny thing. And, and we get certain practices in the culture of our, of our church practices, and, and we can present ourselves in a way that we fit a particular mold that we make ourselves look spiritual. And from the outside, we think, oh, look at them, they're, they're so spiritual, or they've got it all together. And really what's in the inside is corrupt. Now, he's going to call them out, and we'll talk more on that in a little bit. But get the concept here. They were looking to, to be noticed by men. When the truth is, we want to be noticed by God and make sure that our offering, our, our, who we are, is glorifying God, not glorifying self. It is interesting, too. He says, he talks about these titles, rabbi, father, leader. And they had asserted, again, these positions of authority, and they had grabbed these titles to, again, you know, make themselves look holier in a way, more spiritual. But notice how he says that, that when Jesus talks against these, he uses this term, one, verse 8, verse 9, and verse 10. He says, you have one teacher one father, one leader, and that's our Heavenly Father. And the problem with sometimes of these religious titles that can be given is we put men up on par with God, and that should not be. Or sometimes we even elevate them above God. Well, we would trust a pastor or a priest or something above trusting God, and that cannot be that way. Jesus says very clearly, he says, the greatest among you, verse 11, will be your servant. He who humbles himself he who exalts himself will be humbled. Verse 12, whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. And, and this is this upside down kingdom of Jesus, right? And I say upside down, we've mentioned that a few times because we, in our own mind, in our human nature, in man's wisdom, we have a particular flow chart of what a kingdom would look like and who would be the leader of that kingdom. And, and Jesus flips this thing. And he says the, the true leader is a servant. And he models it. I love what uh, Mark says, Mark chapter 10, verse 42 through 45. Jesus says, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them, but it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be a slave of all. 
And he says right here, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Servant leadership is the best. It's the highest and the best. And Jesus models it clearly. So th he instructed, this was, this little section was an instruction for the disciples and for the crowds. Again, he was talking openly about the scribes and the Pharisees. Now he's going to turn and speak directly to them. Now this is a very, um, he's going to use some harsh words, a judgmental condemnation of them. He's calling these guys out for their hypocrisy. It's a very strong language. Look at this, verse 13. He says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. For you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. So I think it's no coincidence if you were to list out these eight woes, as we'll go through these different woes as he calls them out, that the first one has to do with shutting people out from the kingdom of heaven. He addresses this right away. Your actions, the religious practices, and we read earlier in Matthew that they had taken the traditions of men and they become more important than following God. The traditions of man had become more important than God's word. And they were upholding the traditions of men more than God's word. And so in those practices, they were shutting people out from a right relationship with God, to intimacy with God. He says, Woe to you, verse 14, the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses for pretense. You make long prayers, therefore you will receive a greater condemnation. Again, outward sign, long prayers, looking spiritual, and yet they're devouring widows, which is the very thing. We're supposed to true religion. What does James say? Taking care of widows and orphans. Verse 15, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Jesus condemns the scribes and the Pharisees for making these huge efforts to win converts and then leading then the converts into trusting in religious practices and not trusting in God. Strong language here. What did he say in verse 14? Greater condemnation. As if hell wasn't bad enough, there's going to be another level there. <laughs> it's greater condemnation. It says verse 15, the efforts that they had done, make their, the ones, their converts, twice the son of hell. That's why Jesus is so harsh with them here. Verse 16 says, Woe to you blind guides who say whoever swears by the temple that has nothing but whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated this whole section is interesting. There's a, basically, they had created these elaborate oath-making uh, strategies where they could basically make an oath, but if they swear by a certain thing, they wouldn't be held to that oath. And so Jesus calls them out and says, you fools, verse 17, blind men, which is more important, the gold of the temple that sanctified the gold, and whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the offering on it is obligated you blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sacrifices the offering? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears both by the altar and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears both by the temple and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. He's basically saying what he said back in Matthew 5, 37. Let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond that is evil. Again, they had created this system to, to promote their hypocrisy where they could, on the front, on the face, look like they're doing these good works or saying these, taking these oaths, but then they've found their, you know, claws to get out of it. It says, verse 23, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You noticing a theme here? I circled in my Bible. Every time it said hypocrite, I circled. It, it's pretty clear here. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. 
But these are the things that you should have done without neglecting the others. And so he said, he doesn't say you shouldn't have tithed or, or, or gave uh, time to tithing, as he says here, but your tithing can't replace loving your neighbor. It's like if you put your regular tithe in the box and then you're like, okay, I paid my Christian dues. I can now go do whatever I want and be a jerk out to society because I did my little Christian tithe there and now I'm good to go. I've, I've paid for my week in a way. You, you don't, it's not, I think you understand this concept. But I think we do have to be careful. Sometimes we do elevate certain acts of the faith. We lean on our performance or on a religious practice to excuse other attitudes or behaviors. And Jesus says very clearly, a weightier portion of this law was having to do with our fellow brothers and sisters. He says, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. He gives this vivid illustration, verse 24, you blind guides who strain out a gnat, the smallest of the unclean animals, and he says, swallow a camel, the largest of the unclean animal. So you're straining out the little gnat, but you're swallowing a camel when you're practicing this legalistic approach. It says, Woe to you, verse 25, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but the inside of the cup and of the dish, sorry, but of the inside they are full of robbery and self indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup of the dish so that the outside of it may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you are like the whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe. I mean, how would you like to have this little talk with Jesus? <laughs> He's getting after him. And he addresses this hypocrisy of presenting yourself other than what you really are. Like I said, in our, in our culture, in our society, there's a way that we can present ourselves to come off like we've got it together, that we've got it right with the Lord, that we're, you know, we're a good Christian and inside, we could be full of self-indulgence and, and filthiness. That ought not to be this way. I think some of these scriptures are convicting. I think if we're doing a technical interpretation of them, these words were addressed to the religious leaders of Jesus' day. But I think it's very easy to find application for today, not only the religious leaders of today, but our own selves and how we practice our faith and how we go about presenting ourselves and, and our intimacy with our Heavenly Father. We're all hypocrites in a way. I, I get that. What we can do, though, is we can take that hypocrisy, we can take that to God and say, expose that in my life. Lord, help me with that. And let Him deal with that. And let Him mend that and let Him heal that. And we walk in, in a genuine relationship with Him in that way. He says, woe to you, verse 29, you scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. And you say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have partnered with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How will you escape the sentence of hell? I'm telling you, this is, you know, Jesus is basically saying, you know, you, you say if you lived in the day of your fathers, you wouldn't have killed the prophets that came, prophets that were directing you in the ways of God, to follow God, and yet they themselves are plotting to kill Jesus, the Son of God. We saw that come up a couple times in the last couple of parables we read. We read the parable of the landowner, you know, where there was an illustration of God setting up the vineyard and he came to collect produce from it. And what did they do to the heir? They killed the heir. The parable of the marriage feast. We had the, the wedding table set. 
the invitees were all the Israelites. They sent out those to invite them, and they paid no attention. It says, chapter 22, verse 5, and then they, verse 6, they seized them, and they mistreated them, and they killed them. Those were the prophets. So Jesus says, therefore, verse 34, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth. From the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar, truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. The righteous martyrs, A to Z, are going to be a testimony against these guys here. Jesus says in verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Notice a a tone change here that that reveals Jesus' heart. He's teaching the the disciples. He's teaching the crowds that are there. And then he's condemning and he's, he's passing judgment on these religious leaders. But then his heart is revealed at this point where really he just wants to gather Jerusalem. He wants to gather his people under his wings. But it says right here, verse 37, they were unwilling. It says, behold, your house is being left to you desolate. Speaking to the destruction of the temple, which will happen. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Remember that the Bible tells us that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. If we want to know about God, if we want to know the Father's heart, we can look to Jesus. And the heart of God is to gather us under the wings of his protection. But he doesn't force it. It's an invitation. And so I think the call today, as we, as we observe these things, the, the hypocrisy of these religious leaders, to, I think to take stock, examine our own faith, and confess those things where we've been hypocritical to God. But then to have a willingness. I think that's called a willingness. I love that Stories of Grace video about Isaac and Terah. How, how they came to the conclusion. You know, they wanted a, a particular title or, or a certain, they wanted a description, a job description. But then at the end of the day, what did God want? He just wanted them be willing to follow, a willingness. And so I think that's the call for us today, a willingness to open the door for God in our lives, to allow Jesus to sit on the throne in our lives, to sit on the throne as, remember, he's a sovereign king. There's implications there. If we put Jesus as king in our lives, that means that we would submit ourselves to him. A willingness to come to Jesus. Well, Lord God, we thank you for your word this morning. God, I pray as it went out, Lord, that it would pierce our hearts. God, I pray, I ask, Lord, if there is any hypocrisy in us, Lord, that you would reveal that. Lord, we would take note of that and we would, we would change. God, we understand that true change comes from the inside out. Lord, get our hearts, Lord. We want to give you our hearts. Help us to be aware, Lord, when we're trusting in anything other than you. Reveal that to us, God. We want to trust you wholeheartedly, only you. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross. The blood that was shed there. Lord, that we would find life, that we would find that rest for our souls. God, I pray that you would bless everyone here. You'd fill them with your spirit. You would lead them and guide them this week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.